Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union. Today we're looking at indigenous rights in the times of Thanksgiving and we're looking at indigenous resistance from the Russell Tribunal to today. I'm very fortunate to have three guests with us who are very experienced in this Russell Tribunal and have participated throughout and continued up until today to make sure that the human rights of indigenous peoples is respected, protected, and promoted around the planet. I would first like to welcome Phyllis Young, who is an amazing activist who participated in the Russell Tribunal that uh, took place in Rotterdam, Holland 40 years ago. Phyllis, could you share with us why you attended and participated in the Russell Tribunal? Chante was staying up there to use up the I give you, I offer you, offer you my hand with a good heart. Mini tehia we himachapi, na mini yuha naji we himachapi. I'm a woman who stands by the water, woman who loves the water. Those are my given names by my people and my family. Um, we were ten years into the movement in the international community, starting in 1974. Uh, founding of the International Indian Treaty Council here at Standing Rock after Wounded Knee. We um, embarked on finding membership and having a place at the table in the United Nations in 1977. We convened at the Geneva Conference of which I was a coordinator and uh, met the great uh, Edith Ballantyne there, uh, worked with her for many years. And so I'm very privileged to be able to transition and to speak on issues as the movement um, evolved. And so uh, it's a privilege to be here today um, and to have participated in the Bertrand Russell Tribunal in Rotterdam. And we owe a lot to the country of the Netherlands, to those for a who facilitated um, for us to speak and to have a voice and to seek the dignity that all people should have. So um, I come here, I thank you once again, speaking for indigenous peoples uh, all over, but we were 10 years into the movement in the international community and we um, embarked on having a voice through the Bertrand Russell. When we came, I talked about Mar uh, Mario Geruna, who was the chair in absentia, and we protested worldwide and enabled him to present at the last uh, of the days. So uh, victory in protests and marches, and we continue in that um, fashion in a good and peaceful manner. So um, it was a time uh, for us to step up. We were called upon, upon by the chiefs. Uh, we come from a very egalitarian society, a universal society, a pluris pluralistic um, people. So we have a world view, a universal view. So I feel like um, we could feel the spirit and the pain and uh, the absence of uh, indigenous people. At that time, we didn't have the word indigenous because we coined that phrase in the United Nations when we came together. I thought we were all Lakota, I thought we were Indian, I thought we were uh, very exclusive, but we, we are not. And so um, we, we termed the phrase uh, indigenous to include all natural peoples of every land in the world. So, um, unity and so when we we were we were in our adolescence um, when we came to the Russell Tribunal we understood our struggle and we understood the technologies that were being used against us and for them to use um, sterilization uh, was critical to our numbers and our populations because we were uh, diminishing in the Western Hemisphere. North and South America were targets, as well as India, Egypt, and uh, Africa. So um, we had a common voice, we had common ground. And so we were ready. And uh, we stated our case at the tribunal. Um, 
we were not part of a juried um, decision, but we embarked nevertheless on uh, making a statement on the survival of our people, primarily the women. Long story short, Ocheti Shakoi, more men and more women have been sterilized under their program. Thank you so much. And it's important to share that the struggle that you're talking about has been centuries long, but the resistance is even stronger. You also said that you weren't on the jury, but we have a person, Stefano, who's also a professor who can share with us his role at the Russell Tribunal 40 years ago, as well as the most recent three-day seminar that brought all the people together who participated 40 years ago. Stefano? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very glad to be here, accompanying the company of Phyllis, TP, you, Josh, uh, three wonderful, two wonderful women, and uh, one wonderful man. Uh, I came to the Russell Tribunal because at that time in 1980, I had been very active uh, as an anthropologist, Euro-American anthropology. I was born in Italy originally. The unfortunate place of my birth is Genova, which was the, <laughs> the birthplace of Christopher Columbus. Look at the destiny of life. So, but in any case, I migrated as a young man to Peru, looking for, for a change of life. And uh, in the 70s, I got heavily involved in a very important social movement that took place in Peru that was trying to uh, change Peru from a, a sort of feudal society where 400 family own 97% of the land and 90% of the people were indigenous or 80% of the people were indigenous, are indigenous, and the minority of mestizo and white and criollo people on all the land, all the means of production, et cetera. So the revolution was trying to change that. It lasted only five years. It was uh, displaced by a military coup uh, supported by the CIA and the US and uh, Kissinger at the time and, and all the good guys that have ruled over this country. And I was uh, sent into exile to Mexico, self-exile. I decided to leave Peru because of the danger that I was facing. And uh, so when I was invited to the Russell Tribunal, I had in my background this type of uh, curriculum. And uh, I'm an anthropology. I learned anthropology with native people in the Amazon, the Ashanika people. and. Uh, so my participation in, in the jury of, tri of the Russell Tribunal was from a, the point of view of a Westerner, a Latin American citizen that had learned from the indigenous people of the Amazon and the Andes, and then later Mexico and Mesoamerica, about the struggle of survival. And uh, so I, I participated with a few ideas and, uh, and uh, I was surrounded by very important non-indigenous people with the exception, exception of, of Juruna, who was the Brazilian uh, Shavanti representative of the native people of Latin America, South America, or the Americas. Uh, but the rest of us were all uh, Westerners, Euro-Americans. Irmo Bonfil, mestizo from, from uh, Mexico, uh, Darcy Ribeiro, a very good anthropology from Brazil, Eduardo Galeano that then became a famous author, passed away a couple of years ago, unfortunately, uh, and, and other people that were all from, from the Western side of the world. So in a sense was a confrontation, was an accusation of the West brought forward by the indigenous people. And we were all, we knew of uh, what was happening in uh, Indian country, all over the Americas. But to witness the presence of people, native people telling us, native women, native people, na little child like Tipi at that time, telling us their own story with their own voice was a, was a, a shocking, a shocking event that altered completely 
our already altered consciousness into and push us to be more and more active, proactive in what we were doing as social scientists, intellectual activists, etc. So <clears throat> for me, the Russian Tribunal has been a, a very important event in my life, as it was 10 years earlier, the first Barbados meeting of again, only uh, Westerners in the island of Barbados, all of us anthropologists that denounce the role, the colonialist role of anthropology at that time that was conniving and, and behaving in very uh, ethnocentric, Eurocentric ways and using the indigenous people as an object of study without ever being concerned about what was happening to them in real life, the, the, the destruction of their culture, their territory, etc. So the trajectory went from my participation in the Peruvian revolution of the 68-74, the, the Barbados meeting and ended up in the Russell Tribunal. And from there, I started to navigate this troubled, very conflictive waters of the relation of, of the West, of capitalist West, the global West and global North with the indigenous people of America. And I continue to do this as I speak today. I'm the only survivor of the jury. <laughs> it's a strange honor to be the only survivor. I hope I last a few more years so that I can keep working on this issue. But, uh, and we I definitely hope you do too. We think you'll be living a long time Yes. And we know that indigenous peoples came to the Netherlands 40 years ago to speak truth to power. And the values and vision of indigenous peoples is really the solution to many of the global crises he's facing humanity today. And what's important then is also the voices of the young. And amazingly enough, yeah. uh, TP, you're too young to almost be at the meeting. Can you tell us how you came to the Russell Tribunal and how you continue to advocate and walk in the footsteps of your mother as well? TP. Hello, Chante Washte, you have a bit choose up a TPZ with Homan, a matcha be not yell, slaha, a mataha. My name is TPZ with Homan, and I come from Standing Rock. Um, it's an honor to be here to uh, talk about the Russell Tribunal. Again, I, I don't remember being there, but I've seen the pictures, and I know that it was um, an amazing honor. And as um, a participant in the 40th uh, anniversary uh, seminar that was um, a privilege to really witness and be a part of that as well. Uh, my mom took me with her in the cradle board and um, you know all of our all of the things that we're talking about all of this um, the ways of being in our indigenous knowledge you know all of that is through her lived experience of having me in that cradle board and having that connection so that I, as a baby, took in all of these experiences into my heart, my spirit, and really um, set me on my course and carved my path for me to be in Indigenous language revitalization, as well as Indigenous education, as we reclaim um, spaces and create new spaces for our people, our children to really live healthy, fulfilled lives as Lakota, to be free to think and speak and embody all of our values from the time that we're born until the time that we leave this earth. All of those things were set in motion and through the lived experience of those who attended um, the Russell Tribunal, um, as my mother did, as well as my uncle, Bill. Um, and so I know that she had the experience of being around other indigenous people, learning from each other, strengthening each other. And that very much has been my experience in language revitalization, strength from, you know, the Kanaka Maui relatives, the Maori relatives um, in BC, all of the amazing work that is happening for indigenous language revitalization, um, you know, is in that same sense where we can really strengthen each other and learn from each other. And, you know, those, I see those parallels um, in the experience of um, the amazing lived experience of my mother, as well as her continuing to be um, a strong voice and someone that our people can really rally behind and know that she represents 
um, true love of our people, that there's no other real um, authentic agenda other than that, that our, the love of our people motivates us to continue to do um, the work. And that's what she has embodied. And I'm really grateful for um, having her as my mother and role model in that because uh, it's very much uh, opened the doors for me to be on the journey that I'm on. Thank you so much. And it is amazing to go from the cradle board to now to the classroom and making sure that language lives. And of course, we know that's the way that where culture thrives and survives. Phyllis, you shared also a bit about partnering and meeting with other indigenous peoples and TP shared as well, that we continue to learn from one another and build this global movement. Could you share maybe recently about Standing Rock and some of the campaigns that were going on to protect the water and to protect the sacred spaces? We were at different stages um, in our struggles and I was able to, to measure um, time and space in the genocide that was occurring in the Western Hemisphere in Guatemala, the massacres that we endured at Wounded Knee. Um, my absolute hero um, in my life was a Mapuche because I understood um, the terror and the, the death squads and the, the separating of their bodies by horses and tractors as technology evolves. So um, I traveled with Survival International with the Mapuche and I was able to uh, understand their stories and relate to them. Although in, it was in my collective memory of terror and how we survived um, the women as well. So I could measure the stages of that terrorism and genocide as it was occurring. And it was maybe a hundred years ago that we were in a massacre, but it was happening in Central America and South America. So I was, I could relate and that re-energized me to find the best ways to answer the new evolving technologies that were methods of genocide and uh, water was was a key key issue and um, so we have 33 treaties the the Lakota Nakota and Dakota um, with the United States for three centuries we have had 33 treaties and um, the United Nations had a 15-year study um, came out with recommendations and we have a five-step um, process that we need to go through, but the UN recognized the treaty status under the, um, under the Vienna Convention 62, um, which the Mohawks were very, uh, the strongest party to it. So um, it was able to measure all of the technologies, the stages, and to keep our struggle alive for the Black Hills, for the sacredness, the principles that we need to still evolve and adopt and adapt for the world because we have always been the canary in the mine. So I'm able to strategize for the future even though we don't have a word for that in our language. Um, we can conserve the water and we can create international legal principles to protect sacred sites, sacred landscapes that are critical to our survival for freedom of religion, our spirituality, and to worship in the way we want to with the freedom, with no boundaries and no barriers and so, or no buffer zones. So we need to be free to worship, which, which we fought for they, the United States prohibited our spirituality from 1910 to 1978. And in 1978, we took that back, the act of Congress, the freedom of religion um, was endorsed by the US Congress. The sterilization was prohibited by the US Congress. So we, but we had to march, we had to demand, we had to give them our our stories and go to the steps of the capital of the United States. And we prevailed, we endured. So we strategize now for the new serology research. Um, we are the isolated gene factor in the United States as far as our genealogy and our blood. 
So now we, we talk about that for the future for this corona, coronavirus. Thank you. So it's amazing to hear your advocacy and the breadth and depth of all the amazing work that you have done. Uh, it's an honor to meet you and to hear about your campaign. And it's amazing to also see your daughter continuing these campaigns for indigenous rights. Uh, Stefano, could you maybe share some of the results of the Russell Tribunal that are relevant for the human rights of indigenous peoples today as we move forward? It, uh, the balance is uh, ambiguous to say the least, because on one hand, we have a new legal uh, instrument that are international instruments <clears throat> and also some local national instruments that are legal. Now the application and the, the enforcement of this legal instrument is depending very much on the political uh, situation of each country. And we, we just passed through four years of practically banana republic experience in the US. You know, we, we have seen how easy and vulnerable is democracy, what we consider to be a democratic situation. And so that in Latin America is our old experience. We have experienced that since the independence, the, the formal decolonization in the early 19th century, 1821, 1820, 1825, 25th, and so on, for different countries. <clears throat> so legal instruments are fundamental, but the enforcement of those uh, measures are also fundamental. And the enforcement can be done with the participation only and exclusively with the participation, mobilization of the people. The people had to be in the street, the people had to demonstrate, the people had to occupy, the people had to show their strength and their ideas and their vocation of the democratic behavior in action. Because it is important that, uh, you know, professor like me writes about these things, but it is important that the young people, the older people, everybody, the women, the men take this idea and co bring this idea in their own, obviously, their own ideas into action. So the result uh, are on one hand, uh, I, I see them as uh, with optimism, but on the other hand, I see them as an, an invitation to continue to struggle. I mean, this, <clears throat> what we have seen, and I repeat, insist during the last four years, shows us how, how vulnerable are our uh, Western institution. And if I compare to the permanent, the permanence of Indian institution, and I see, for instance, yesterday we saw uh, Patricia Walinga from the Ecuador, from the Amazon, show, uh, showing us the, the, the permanence of her ideas, the idea of her people about the, the environment. And so that permanence contrasts very much with the vulnerability of our Western institution. We are so proud of our democracy, but we shouldn't be proud of it. We should be proud of their democracy, the indigenous people, the way they look at the, at the world, the way they act and are present in the world. That is what these debates the Russell Tribunal, uh, other seminar, other event can show us, all of us as humanity, a uh, you, you, united humanity of different languages, different uh, ethnicity to coexist together and get the best of all our tradition and put them together to build constantly a new world. The, I, I'm so glad for instance that it is reviving language. Language is fundamental. Fortunately, colonialism in Latin America wasn't successful as in North America with English to displace native languages. So we have many more native languages in Latin America, south of the border of the US, study for the Navajo Hopi all the way down south of people that can still think, speak, create, invent in their own language. So the philosophy of the indigenous people is based 
and express in a specific language. The Lakota, the Dakota, the Cheyenne, the, the, the other tribe. Thank I, you, Stefano. That yeah. is a perfect point. Um, and perfect. we can then go into uh, TP sharing some of the aspects of the new revitalization programs uh, at Standing Rock. TP, can you share some of that? Yes, I, I would be honored to. Um, in the past 10 years alone, um, partnerships have really, uh, with allies um, who are non-Lakota and as well as other Lakota and Dakota communities um, have really advanced language in a way where it's becoming more accessible to especially younger children. Standing Rock in 2012 opened a Lakota language immersion nest, which is full 100% um, Lakota language immersion. I was fortunate to be a, a co-teacher there with a fluent elder speaker uh, for five years in the initial first five years of being in the school. And I witnessed um, the revitalization of our, our ways of thinking, um, our ways of being, as well as our language through our community's own children. And it was really the highlight, I believe, and um, really nourished my spirit to keep going and figure out ways to keep advancing, keep expanding, and keep um, pushing for successful um, language efforts, not just in the classroom now, but in maybe in homes and other spaces that it's really important that uh, we keep pushing and we don't just, um, there's so much at stake and time is really short. And with Corona, um, we've lost some of our most fluent regal speakers. And so time is really short and the work is really important. And so um, if anyone wants to contribute, I think they would learn to um, really support the languages in their area, wherever they live, whoever you are. That's a way that can really help repair the damage that has been done to indigenous peoples um, all over the world. Thank you so much. And it's amazing how fast time flies. That's what one of the participants said at the uh, three webinars who had been involved in indigenous work their entire life. I want to thank all three of you for committing a lifetime to liberation and the human rights of indigenous peoples. And we look forward to continue the conversation into the future. But more importantly, I think as everyone summarized, it's really a combination of direct action putting those human rights into practice and standing up for what we believe in. And then also the diplomacy at the global level to create those new international instruments. And the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is one of those. But as was pointed out by Stefano as well as Phyllis, now we have to go towards the implementation and the actualization of those articles into daily life. And TP, you're doing that with language as those are some of the most important articles of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So thank you all very much. And thank you for tuning in to Cooper Union. And we'll continue to explore the most important issues at the United Nations. Mahalo.